First Kings chapter number six. Now, let me give you a little bit of backstory because we're not going to have time to read it all. This, in chapter number 6, beginning in verse number 1, is the beginning of not just stockpiling material, not planning on one day we're going to build a temple in Jerusalem. Okay, this is where the rubber meets the road. God promised David that his son would be able to build the temple unto him but David couldn't because he was a man of bloody hands he had fought many wars so David prepared and he laid aside all the materials that would be necessary but he wasn't allowed to start building it and then Solomon becomes king and it's not until his fourth year as king that he's allowed to start laying the foundation literally with stone and then building the edifice that eventually would be called Solomon's Temple, but really it wasn't Solomon's Temple, it was God's Temple. And without a doubt, regardless of who you ask, the most beautiful, most magnificent, you know, greatest building that has ever been raised by human hands was Solomon's Temple. Okay? And it wasn't like they just called it Solomon's Temple because he was king. No, he was directly involved. He oversaw it. He took it personally. He said, God told my dad that his son would build it. He said, I'm going to be there. And I'm going to make sure that everything's done the right way. So, we're going to begin reading in verse number 5. Okay. And against the wall of the house. Okay, now, we've got to stop again because i got to clarify something. It's talking about the house of God, not just a house. Okay, the house of God was what you know, nowadays we might call the temple. Or, if we want to put it into terms of a many Baptist church, that'd be the sanctuary. Okay, so the house, that's where God's temple was. Then he says, around it. So this is outside of it. Okay, against it. That's not a part of it, but it's on the outside. It's all connected. But it's not the house of God. This is for other stuff. Okay? So verse number 5. He said, And against the wall of the house he built chambers round about. It means all the way around. Against the walls of the house round about. Both of the temple and of the oracle. And he made chambers round about. Well, what's that? Well, that's where the priests would live. He's making housing available to those that are going to serve in the Lord's temple but it's not a part of the temple. Okay, he says, there's the temple of God, there's the house of God, which here in a couple of chapters you go and read, God came down and filled the house with a cloud of smoke, and it was so strong that all the priests had to leave anyway. Right, and God did that as a sign of his approval, and that he accepted what was done for his honor and his glory. That Israel said, God's our God, and we want to place solely devoted to God we don't want men to be attached to it we don't want priests to get the you know the honor and the glory there's God's house and then there's everything around God's house right we don't want that to bring attention we want God's house to get all the attention so when he says that they're building these chambers round about that's what goes on on the outside kind of like uh, think of it this way there was a thing called Solomon's porch that was on the front of the temple but that was that was different. That's not like a porch we think about. You guys know them verandas that go around, they got the screen all the way around the house? Right? Think of something like that, only it's bedroom chambers. It's places for priests to sleep. It's places to keep materials that they would need in order to serve and fulfill their duties inside of the house of God. But the house of God was sanctified. It, it was holy. Nothing went on in there that wasn't according to what God said by God's instructions. Keep that in mind. Then verse number 6. Okay, these are measurements, but we really not interested in the measurements today. But the nethermost chamber of five cubits broad, and the middle was six cubits broad, and the third was seven cubits broad. 
For without in the wall of the house he made narrowed rest round about that the beams should not be fastened in the walls of the house. And the house, when it was in building, was built of stone made ready before it was brought thither, so that there was neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was in building. Okay, that's where we're going to stop reading, but we got to go back. Okay. For your imaginations, the temple was 30 cubits high. Well, how, how big is a cubit? Well, it depends on who you ask, and we really don't know. The definition is a cubit was from elbow to fingertip. Well, my cubit's a little bit different than everybody else's cubit. Right? Depending on how tall or how big you are, right? Brother Peter's house is going to be a whole lot bigger than, you know, let's say Brother Brandon's house, right? It's just going to be, it's going to be bigger. Right? Likewise, if we used one of the youngins running around, right, we'd all be squatting when we walked through places. Right? There was a measurement called a cubit, but no, it was between 16 and could, you know, be all the way up to 23 or 24 inches, depending on who you ask. Because we don't know. But we do know that the temple of God was 30 cubits tall. The chambers that went around the outside, they were only 6 cubits tall. I'm sorry, 5 cubits tall. So when you walked in, there was no doubt what was important about the place you're getting ready to go to. That thing's 25 cubits taller than the chambers that go around the outside. But you needed the chambers. I mean, it goes in in verse number 6 and talks about uh, the three different types of chambers, how wide they were, how tall they were. Okay, they were used for all different manner of things. You needed a place to keep the oil so that you could go and keep the lamp or the lantern, which nowadays they call a menorah, inside of the house of God lit. Right? God instructed that light never goes out. Right? In fact, that's where you get the events that surround Hanukkah. Right? They ran out of oil in the temple of God, but for seven days it kept burning even though they didn't have any oil. What happened? God moved in. Right? And by the way, Jesus did attend the festival of lights. What was that? Hanukkah. He was just saying, yeah, God did it. He was giving praise and honor to the Father. But anyway, you need a place for the oil. You need a place for the you know, material, the showbread had to be put out in the temple of God every day. Well, who made that? Angels didn't come by and just drop it off. You needed the materials to cook and to bake the showbread. That's what went into these chambers. Right? The high priest may have a house that he lives in with his family, but when he's at the house of God, he may need a place to change, to take a nap. He may be there for a couple of weeks just doing nothing but offering sacrifices up to God, what happened? He gets one of those chambers. Right? The Levites that were to serve in the house of God, they need a place to stay. Right? So all of that, that's what's going on on the outside. But if you'd have walked up and seen it, you wouldn't have even noticed the things going around on the outside. Because what was in the middle was what drew your attention. That was the temple. Okay? I'm 25 cubits taller. Let's say it was a foot and a half. Okay, those little chambers that go around the outside, if it was a foot, seven and a half feet tall. I mean, depending on when your house was built, that's about the average height of a ceiling in your house. Right? Well, take that, seven and a half, multiply that by about six, and that's the temple. Because that was five cubits. This is 30 cubits. So, I mean, you're talking at least 40 feet tall here. Right? That drew your attention. You weren't worried about the chambers that were going around on the outside of it. You was looking at the temple. Okay? But, in verse number 7, he said, keep in mind, everything was ready made before it was brought up to the temple mount. And it was on the top of a mountain. Very peak of it. In fact, you go and find out it was the threshing floor that David purchased. Right? Well, that threshing floor had to be somewhere up high so that the wind could take off the chaff and that the wheat would be able to fall back down. Right? If you didn't have a threshing floor on top of a mountain, your wheat wasn't very clean and people didn't want to buy it because it was filtered with chaff. You don't want chaff, you want wheat. So this is on top of a mountain. But they're bringing up big stones. 
Right, these are, you go and study out how to hew them out. Right, these weren't little itty bitty bricks. No, no, no. You want to found ask Brother Ray. You want a foundation for something that's going to be forty feet tall and made entirely out of stone. You're going to need a big foundation, and the walls are going to have to be pretty sturdy. But everything was made and ready before they brought it to the mountain. You know how precise they had to be with measurements. There's, you know, measure twice, cut once, Brother Ray, but it's a whole lot easier if you mess it up to go back down and just grab another two-by-four and then cut another one than it is to go all the way back to the rock quarry and say, hey, you guys were off an inch. We need another big rock. Everything. Precise, I mean, they double-checked it because when they took it, they said, okay, it's done. Somebody had to haul that all the way up the mountain and then put it to where it needed to be either in the foundation or in the walls or as a part of the roof. But even when they got there, it says that there wasn't sound of hammers or anything made out of iron. Keep in mind, they not only used stone, they also used the very famous type of wood in your Bible, cedars of Lebanon. That's a hard wood. Right? Not just hardwood, that's one of the hardest hardwoods. Can you imagine having to drill out the holes for them pegs to go through and then make the peg and know that when they get to the top of the mountain, it's going to slide in there and fit perfect and everything's going to be okay? Because they can't use hammers. They're not using iron tools when they get up there to make the hole a little bit bigger. Everything done to the nth degree because it was God's house. They sought perfection. In fact, when Solomon ordered the cedars from another king, he said, hey, you and my dad were friends. He said, I want to buy some of them cedars to go into the house of God. He says, but we don't know how to cut down cedar trees. He said, we don't have cedars. He said, you guys know what you're doing. So however many men you need, let me know what the price is going to be, and I'll pay it. And then the king said, hey, we'll be honored to take part in it. And he named his price, and Solomon paid all the food that that guy needed to live off of for an entire year every year until that guy died that was the price but he was willing to pay it him and his whole family were fed because they were just willing to be a part of what God wanted to do Solomon was increased greatly right? it wasn't anything to him to make sure this guy's house was fed for a year but he understood we don't have the expertise he says the way we're going to do this we're not going to have hammers up there because the only thing that needs to go on in the house of God is worship unto God. We're not going to make clang and clatter and a whole bunch of racket. He says, we're going to be respectful and reverent while we're in the house of God. And we're not going to make any noise in there until we are ready to offer up worship unto God. He says, so everything has to be perfect. He said, we don't know how to do that, but you guys do. And the king said, all right, we'll start a chopping. You tell me where. He said, we'll float them down the river. And we'll take them out of the river wherever you tell us, and then we'll start doing it however you tell us to do it. Same thing with the quarrymen. Right? Except those were Israelites. Solomon sent, I think, if memory serves me right, about 33,000 people down to the quarry. Said, start cutting out rock. Start measuring it. Start shaping it. He said, when we're ready, then we got to take it all the way up to the mountain. And once we're there, it's got to be put in place, but it's got to be perfect because we're not going to have any more tools up there to start hacking away and shaping. All that being said, go back with me in verse number 6. Okay, about halfway down through that verse, you're going to find a colon. Okay, it says, For without in the wall of the house. Remember the house, that's the temple. Without is not within. That means on the outside of the wall of the house. Okay? It says, He made narrowed rest round about that the beams should not be fastened in the walls of the house. Okay, now, verse number 5, he's talking about the chambers that he's building. Verse number 6, it says, The nethermost chamber. He's still talking about the chambers. And then halfway through, He's saying, you know, halfway through verse 6, he says, and the roof for those chambers, they were put on 
on the outside of the house of God so that the beams shouldn't be fastened to the walls of God. Now follow me here. It took me a minute to wrap my head around this, so we'll, we'll try. He's saying, all those rooms that we're building around the house of God, they need a roof. He says, and they're built up against the house of God, but they're not a part of the house of God. He said, they've got walls, but their walls aren't connected to the walls of the house of God. He said, they're made of the same stuff, but it's not a part of God's house. This is something for oil. This is something for wood, maybe the, you know, stockpile wood for the altars. Right? This might be one of the places where they kept one of them. You know, they say that there were up to four or five extra of them giant menorahs that they kept, not just, you know, ready, but if the main one went out or they needed to clean it, they had to have a backup. And they was made out of gold. They was pretty heavy. They took up room. You go and study it out. It's about yay big. With seven lanterns in them. Had to burn all the time. Okay, in fact, they've got the one that's going to go into the new temple during the millennial reign already ready. You can Google it. It's they've got it, you know, it's in a big glass case on display for everybody to see. Sucker's big. Right? And it was made according to the standards of the Old Testament, not God's standards. Because they were worried. They were like, well, gold's so heavy it won't be able to support its own weight. And if you just do it the way God says, do it, it'll work out. And it did. But it's on display. You can go see it. All that being said, they need a place to put those. Right? You know, think about around here. Anybody see a vacuum cleaner in here this morning? No, because we got a place for those. It's not in the sanctuary. It's a way where nobody sees it. Because we don't want people walking in saying, why in the world is there a vacuum cleaner over there? Right? That would distract. Right? Because that right there, that's the goal. To God be the glory. Same mindset here. He says, I don't want people when they come to the house of God, when they walk into the house of God, to see a whole bunch of wood sticking out on the walls. Because we needed a place to fasten those rafters for the outside things because it was so much shorter the only way that you were going to get those beams if you wanted to attach it to the house of God the only way you could do it would be to drive them through the wall right anybody disappointed this morning because when you walked in you couldn't see all of the uh, roofing inside I can tell you this it's nothing special it's just four big red beams that meet in the, in the top up there uh, it's red iron. That's what messes with the cell phone reception around here. Okay, it's nothing special. Just a whole bunch of red iron. Well, how do you know what it looks like? Well, because there's a room up there with Brother Randy. You can go back there and get a glimpse of what the, the roof looks like. But anybody upset that, you know, part of the drywall isn't peeling? You can see the, you know, what am I looking for? Those metal things, Brother Ray. The studs, yeah. Anybody upset you can't see some studs today? Right? No. Well, Solomon was trying to think the same way. He says, the house of God, when you walk in, you know, you couldn't see everything. There was the holiest of holies. Only high priest could go there. Right? And there were certain places that unless you were a Levite, you couldn't go there. Or unless you were a priest, you couldn't go there. And then, men had their own place. Women had a different place up in the balcony. You say, well, what are you saying? You couldn't see everything, but he wanted to make sure that you didn't see the things that you didn't need to. He says, around the outside, when they built the walls of the temple, they made grooves or rests, little notches that the beams would sit into. Okay, kind of like them Lincoln logs. Anybody remember them? They had little cutouts. Now you could attach them together, but then you could take them apart again. They weren't the same, but you can make it sturdy. Well, sort of the same thing. They made the beams and they made grooves in the rock, but they said it can be against it. Remember that's the word that he said? But if you pulled hard enough, it was coming off. 
Right? It's not a part of the temple of God, but we need somewhere. But we're not going to take away from what's rightfully God's so that we can feel better about the roof over on these chambers. He says, we're not going to poke a hole through the wall of God, because that's the way that they thought about it. That wasn't a wall, that's God's wall. That wasn't the floor, that was God's floor. Right? Those weren't windows, those were God's windows. Because it was dedicated unto God. So they said, we're not going to put a hole in God's wall so that we can put a beam through it so that we can add a roof onto the outside of the temple. They said, we'll make a groove or a rest that we can sit it there and it'll do the job, but then also we're not taking God's wall and poking a hole through it. He said, well, did God like the job that they did? Well, I don't know. He only filled the house. Right? It's a, even to this day, people know about Solomon's temple. Right, Solomon, his entire reign had a life of peace and prosperity as opposed to his father David who was always having wars on some side. Right, But Solomon had peace on all sides. And you study it out, what he ruled was a whole lot bigger than what that map over there will tell you Israel was. He had a great swath of land. God increased greatly. Why? Because he just followed after God. He did what God told him to do. The things that he desired weren't for his own glory, but for, you know, the wisdom to judge God's people. Right? The knowledge on how to lead them into what God would want them to do. So when it came to building a house, he said, I know we got to have some storage rooms and we got to have some bunk beds tucked away somewhere, but he said, we can build them without taking away what, from what is God's. And we're not going to put a hole in God's wall so that over here we can put a beam on the outside he says we figured out a way to do it all right, so we had to go through all of that to get to this thought okay. imagine if you will does not the New Testament tell us that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit that he indwells this fleshly tabernacle right he sealed us when we got saved so now he's in us and we are in him right well if we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? this is what Solomon did, said. He said, we're going to build a temple for God. Here's the standard. You got the temple. That's for, first and foremost. That's the thing that you see. That's the thing that ended up everything on the inside was gilded with gold. All the instruments that they used were either solid silver or solid gold. They were the finest. They had the best wood, not just hay wood, but cedar wood. The wood of the floor was all made of cedar. I mean, even to this day, they, if you get them, you know, I can't, today vocabulary is out the window. But there's those things you can buy for your shoes to keep them from getting molded. I can't remember what they're called. I got about four pairs of them, just can't remember what they're called. They're always made out of cedar because one, they absorb, absorb moisture, moisture. And if you got leather shoes, that keeps them from getting all warped and stuff. Right? Keeps them from dry rotting out. Yeah. And it'll keep the shape of the foot. So that next time you put it on, instead of having a funky bend in it, because you threw it in the bottom of your closet and something else fell on top of it. No. The form of it will keep it the way that it's supposed to look. But also, cedar just smells good. Right? I get salmon all the time. They cook it on cedar. You know why? Makes things taste good. Right? What's the point? They not just put something in there that looked good. It served a purpose. If it got a little humid, which was rare in the middle of the desert, but if it got a little humid, the cedar would absorb the, absorb the moisture, keep it from getting to the gold and the silver and making things tarnished. Right? It'd keep things from rusting. Okay, but not only that, you get a lot of people in one room after they've hiked up a mountain, it might smell a little bad. Cedar would cover that smell up. It absorbed the things that weren't pleasant so that you weren't sitting there thinking, man, Brother Brian smells today. <laughs> right? You'd be in the house of God thinking about God. Right? There was a method to everything that they did. There was a reason, and it was all for one purpose. God's glory. I don't want to think about people when I'm in here. I want to think about God. 
Right? I don't want to be distracted because I looked up and I saw a piece of gold flake coming off of the wall. Right? I mean, Dad says all the time, Brother Charlie used to say, you've got to make it shiny for the service. Well, sometimes you've got to make it shiny for the people of God because some of them got a little bit ADD. They get distracted. But Solomon said, when well, you walk in here, everything done to take your eyes off of everything but God. Well, we are the temple of God. So therefore, in our life, everything should be done to take the eyes away from anything but God. We have to have chambers around us. We'll get to them in a second. But the temple. First off, verse number 4, he says, In the house, and for the house, he made windows of narrow light that was that is very thin thin windows throughout why because when you went in first not a lot of light right it was supposed to be solemn right first thing you do with the lights get dimmed a little bit you start focusing a little bit more you've got to pay attention to where you're going it wasn't dark it's just dim. Keep in mind, they had a whole bunch of lamps and lanterns and everything else in there, so that would have lit it up. But you didn't want, you know, walking through, you catch a sunbeam in your eye and think, ah, now all of a sudden you've lost focus of whatever you were talking or thinking about. Now you're worried about, well, who put that window there? Right? Narrow light. Also didn't want, keep in mind, they didn't have windows back in the day like we do. They didn't have glass as readily available as we did or do. A window was a hole in the wall. Narrow to keep the weather out. If it rained, if the wind blew some dust up from the bottom of the mountain, narrow windows meant doesn't get inside of the house of God. Right? And then the roof was to keep, you know, if it did rain, things going off of the edge gutters kind of like we have nowadays right you take the edge of the roof over it doesn't get in the window it falls off the edge of the roof but all that being said the narrow windows symbolizes in our life narrow window I don't get my light from outside I get my light from inside right so many people knocking holes in the walls of their life trying to get a view of what's going on outside I can tell you not going to look good some people freaking dad asked me the other day, you see the news no why because I really I could care I couldn't care less really couldn't you know why I'm focused on this I'm more worried about what does God want me to do today I can't afford to think about everything else I prayed. I did what God wanted me to do. I just believe the rest is in His hands. What more could I do? Get angry? Well, that might shift my focus away from certain things. What more could I do? Sit there and everybody that comes into the office, hey, what do you guys think about this? Looking for peace and security elsewhere? I've got peace that passes all understanding. I'm on the solid rock, I've got a foundation. But he said narrow lights. You know why they had some light? Because if you get inside in a place that doesn't have any windows, i.e. my bedroom, you don't know what time of day it is. Right? Especially for those few weeks when the battery in my clock died and I kept forgetting to change it. It was always like 8 o'clock in either in the morning or the afternoon because the clock was frozen. But if you don't have any windows, you don't know what time it is. If you've got narrow windows, you can see, well, it's getting late. I need to get home. Right, or we're running out of time. I've got to get back and fix food for the family. Or I've got to go to the fish market and buy food so that we can have dinner tonight. Right, We do need to have narrow slits in our temple so that we can see what time of day it is. field is wide under harvest, but the sun's going down. Right, if you close yourself off completely and you have nothing from the outside world, you don't realize how bad it is. Right? I know it's late. That's why I don't have time to deal with X, Y, and Z. 
I'm trying to focus on one thing. That's what he wants me to do. We start adding other things in. It gets a little complicated. I've got to start deciding, well, who's going to get my time? Now, I'll just give it to him. Not always perfect, but I'm trying. Right? He's working on me. But the windows do remind me there is a time to leave and go into the field to harvest. Right? There is a time that we got to go out and labor in love for the Lord. I'm speaking metaphorically here. That's not why they had windows, but you guys get that. Now let's get to them things on the outside. Right? Everybody in here, without excuse, to not stand up and say, God has blessed me with things as a Christian. Israel was blessed that they were able to have all that oil, all the timber, everything that they needed, all the material to make those lights for inside of the temple, all those vessels. Right, they had spares of all them things, by the way. Where do you think they kept them? In the things on the outside. They were blessed, but all that stuff, it wasn't a part of the house of God. In fact, you go and study it out. All those vessels, they eventually get carried away into captivity by Babylonian and Persian kings and the kings of the Medians. Right, all those vessels, they were taken, but the house... Is destroyed, is left where it was. Those things didn't make the temple. They were given so that you could use them in the temple. All those plates, all those vessels, all those precious gems that you find that were decorating the inside of the house of God, they were all freely given by God's people as an offering. So that the priests could do what God wanted them to do inside of the temple so that the house of God would be the best house in all of Israel. That it put the king's palace to shame. They did it out of love. But later you find that, you know, Ezekiel and Nehemiah, you go read that, they didn't have all the cedar of Lebanon. They didn't have the best rocks from the best quarry. in the land. They had to build with what they had. But yet God still honored it because they did it the right way. That some people may be on the inside gilded with gold. They may have laid up treasures in heaven. Right? But other people, they may have gone through a storm or two. Things may look a little tarnished. Right? That's not for me. That's all on the inside. Right? I may go through a storm and God may take away some of them golden plates. Right? I, in ignorance, may get rid of some of them. But all those things are not a part of the house of God. That's why they were on the outside. That's why those wooden beams didn't come through the walls of the house of God. Because he said, we're not going to defile what's God's with what's man's. So the reason we went through all of that was to show some people got too many things poking into their temple on the inside. Some of us got too many rafters that we're saying, well, this means a lot to us too. So we're going to anchor it on inside into that temple of God. Well, you're either all gods or you're not all gods. That's the way God sees it. You can't have two masters. You love one, hate the other. Right? You're either all in or you're not all in, which means you're all out. It's man's mentality that says, well, if I'm 99% in, but let's be honest. Nobody's ever 99% in. They just kick the other 1% and they go 100% in. But you're either all or none. Well, I, I show up to church on time, something I can't say today because it's stupid roundabout. But, well, I'm always there on time every time that the doors are open. Okay? But what do you do on the inside? You're a temple. Your purpose is, one, to go and tell others, but two, to bring honor and glory unto God. To be conformed to the image of His Son. To say, I'm no longer my own. I've been bought with a price. I am a temple. Am I a perfect temple? No, but one day I will be. I have a body fashioned like His. Right? But while I'm doing it, there are some things that, we, you know, God, you know, if God blessed you with a car... Hallelujah. 
but your car doesn't have anything to do with your spirituality. That's one of them things that are built on the outside. It leans up against You can use the car to go do things that God wants you to do. You can use a car so that you don't have to wake up at 4 in the morning and put a horse in front of a cart and then ride the cart all the way to church today. Right? Hallelujah. But if something goes wrong with the car, that doesn't affect the temple. It's not a part of the temple. It can fall off and the temple will still be okay. Right? Relationships, family, friends, they're not a part of the temple. It may hurt to lose them, but they're not attached. They're on the outside. They lean up against the house of God or the temple. And if you were to lose it, it can be rebuilt. It can be added. God made a way that you can fasten things in your life to the house of God, but it won't take away from your spirituality. Other people just don't believe that God can hold on to it if they put it there. And they say, well, let's anchor it into the wall. Well, then you're taking away something that belongs to God. The moment that we start saying, well, Lord, I don't believe that you can balance this. Because that's what they were doing. They were just balancing that wood into this notch that was made up against the house of God. Well, if God can keep the earth spinning and the moon spinning and keep the sun where it's at so that it's not too close and it's not too far away so that we don't freeze or melt. That if he can keep every single one of them red blood cells in my body right where it needs to be so that he can take oxygen to everything, I think he can handle the things in my life that I just entrust unto him. Lord, I know this doesn't have to do with my spirituality, but you've given it to me, and I want to take care, but I also know that you can take care of it better than I can. And Lord, if it falls away, the Lord give it, Lord take it away, blessed be the name of the Lord. He can slay me, yet will I serve him. Where am I going to serve him? In the temple that he gave me. He can take away everything on the outside. He can take away the porch, but you go and study it out. You can study out the porch. He can take away the roofs, of everything in the rooms on the outside, but as long as I've still got the temple, I've got what God wants me to have. Solomon was saying, that's God's and that's what's important. And for convenience, we'll put these things around us. But they're not a part of the house of God. And if we were to lose them, it's okay. We could still worship God in the house of God. But how many people are looking at them five cubit tall shacks on the outside? Well, they weren't really shacks. They were done the right way. But in comparison, it's just a shack. This is the greatest building there had ever been built. It had been decorated with so much gold and silver, right? It put the Pope's house to shame. And that was the point. This is God's house. It ought to be the best. So in comparison, just some brick and a, you know, a few slats on top of the roof. Right? That did look dingy compared to the house of God. But if they lost it, they weren't concerned. They still had the house of God. The house of God was the symbol of the presence of God among God's people. That's why when the temple was destroyed, it was a symbol that God left because Israel didn't want him no more. And when they rebuilt the temple, it was saying, we want God above all else. But when we start throwing things through the temple of ourselves, that tabernacle that He's given us, what we're saying is, Lord, we don't care about what you desire from us. Can you scoot over a little bit so I can put this in? I want a little bit bigger window over here on this wall. You mind scooching over a little bit? I want to put a flat screen up over there. I don't want one of them fancy recliners that, you know, will not only massage it, you know, it's got the speakers next to your head, right? It'll have a TV screen in front, so when you lean back, the TV screen's still right there. I don't even know that. I'm sure it does because somebody out there is that lazy. But the whole point, Israel started knocking holes in the wall. They started taking away from what was devoted unto God and what happened? Well they only got led into captivity for a couple of thousand years didn't have a place to call their own until 1946 and this happened a long long time ago happened, you know this was built in about 967 BC you know what that means? thousand years before Jesus so from the time that it was built until the time that it was destroyed 
from that point until Jesus came. I mean, that's about four or five hundred years. At least just between the end of Malachi and the beginning of Matthew. But they still had the temple, but it was Solomon's temple. It wasn't the one that was designed and intended to be the place that people would know. You can make a mess of your temple and God may move in and rebuild your temple. But it's a whole lot better not to lose it in the first place. You know, honestly, if we were to step back and say, how many things do we have poked? You guys know them magicians? Magicians. To take them swords and stick them into boxes and then the chick gets out of the box and none of it's touched her. That's the game that we're trying to play with God. All right, God, I'm going to put this inside and as long as everything's okay and, you know, there's no screaming and as long as it comes out the other side without blood on it, we're just going to keep moving God into a smaller and smaller spot. That's not how God works. You grieve God, God won't. He may wink at our ignorance and give us the space of grace to get it made right. But if we ignore it, he'll get up and go. Why are we hitting on all this? Well, what is? there was supposed to be an inauguration in 10 days. They already canceled that. I don't know what's going to happen, but I do know people need to see Jesus. So if somebody looks at your life and they see a building that's got a whole bunch of planks driven through it, Looks like a mishmash of, you know, somebody that was trying to build a Frankenstein only out of buildings. And then you walk out and say, what's that? That's the temple of God. Really? That's what you think of your God? But then, on the other hand, you didn't have to tell anybody in Solomon's day where God's house was. It's on the mountain. Right? It shone in the sunlight. There were smoke pillars going up around people offering sacrifices unto God right it, it was visible from wherever you were and it had the signs that, that hey what's going on there that sounds like that's God's house you didn't have to ask you just knew and then if there's any doubt if you walked in you really knew in fact anybody remember that story well not story but the account of when the Queen of Sheba came to see Solomon she said, you know, she paraded all these spices and paraded all these, you know, wares that she had from her trying to impress him because she was going to offer him as payment for his wisdom. He didn't care. And then when the Queen of Sheba saw him walk into the house of God, well, what happened? He took off his kingly garments. And he put on garments that humbled him before God. Right? He walked in with reverence, with humility. And when the Queen of Sheba saw that, she said, Then I understood what made this man a great king. She said, It wasn't that he had great taste or great desire. It wasn't that he sought out the best scholars. No, he just honored and loved God. Because see, even Solomon, when he walked in, you know, the Bible says that Solomon reigned in all of his glory, still wasn't as beautiful as one lily. But what, he understood that. He understood that when he walked into the house of God, it wasn't about him. It was about God. That's why when Solomon let his heart be take, drawn away from God with all them foreign and strange wives that he had, that he bowed down and worshipped false gods in his old age. God can take what he gave to you, and he can take it away. You give it to somebody else, that will use it. What happened? Well, in Solomon's personal temple, some things got driven through the walls. And God said, hey, ought not be that way. And he kept doing it anyway. So God took the wisest man and made a fool out of him. Did the same thing to Balaam, by the way. Had him out eating grass in a field like a donkey. And then a donkey preached to him. Right, what? What's the point? Keep your temple the way that God wants it. But I don't know why. Don't understand how something that used to be what you wanted, same color it always was, but you want new paint. Why? Was that good back then? Why is it, it's still, still good today. This is how my brain works. 
The paint is paint. I, I, I don't understand. I don't. I don't understand why I got so frustrated about this. When mom had new carpet put in the basement, oh, we're going to paint your room. Why? It's got paint already. And she's, well, we're going to paint it this color. That's gray. Yeah, it's already gray. Why are we repainting it gray? Well, this is a different gray. It's gray. It's not changing. You can't tell. What's the point? I, I didn't understand it. Well, how come so many people are trying to remodel the inside of their temple? Right? Well, we've got to have this. We've got to have that. What does God say you've got to have? Stick with that. Right? I mean, no one says stick to the old paths. Everybody's looking for the new. Well, hey, let's put a wash on the outside of the temple. Right? Like they used to do with those old wood fences. They'd whitewash them. Right? Make it look, well, what did Jesus say about the Pharisees? They were whited sepulchers. They look nice on the outside, but they're full of dead men's bones on the inside. Right? God's not interested in what the outside looks like, so to speak. That's where they kept all them shacks. That's where they kept all the supplies. They understood we can lose all that, but as long as what's on the inside is still the same, we can still worship God and we'll have a place. It's the best that we could do. You know, it's not worthy of God, but God chose to dwell there. And as long as we've still got that place, everything will be okay. Protected at all costs. In fact, that's where the Ark of the Covenant was. Inside of the holiest of holies. Right, that's where everything that God had ever promised them, the covenant that He had made with them, that's where it all lasted. Or rested. That's where their hope was. Well, some people got hope outside the temple and they're trying to drive it into the temple. All that's going to do is hurt the hope and the faith and the things that God's blessed you with so that you can be a temple unto Him. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.